uh, along with everything else in life, has changed radically and continues to change along with the world changing. And so when we look at the ancient writings, we find that dreams used to mean different things way back in the days of the prophets. The meanings changed. The same dream, the same scene, and yet the meaning is different in the Middle Ages. And then in the more recent past, again, they've changed. So we'll try to get a picture of what the dreams have meant and what they possibly mean in our world, in our life today. Let's start with the Bible. The first dream that is described in great detail is the dream that Pharaoh had, or the dream that Joseph had. Pharaoh's dream is described as Pharaoh sleeping, and he had a dream. And in his dream, he saw seven cows. And they were healthy, fat cows coming out, of the, uh, coming out of the Nile, I guess. And then after them, seven other cows came out of the Nile. And these were very emaciated, unhealthy cows. And the unhealthy cows swallowed the healthy cows. And yet the unhealthy cow continued to look unhealthy, as if they hadn't eaten anything at all. And Pharaoh woke up, and his heart pounded. Something told him that this was not an ordinary dream. So what did he do? He went back to sleep. And he had another dream. And in the second dream, he saw seven healthy stalks of wheat. And then after that, seven beaten stalks of wheat grew out of the ground. And the seven beaten, broken stalks swallowed up the seven healthy stalks and didn't change. And that was the end of a dream. And when he woke up, he knew that he had to find out what this dream meant. And so he called all of his advisors and his sorcerers and his magicians and so on and so forth. And each one of them interpreted the dream for him, but it didn't, it didn't calm him. It didn't satisfy him. And then somebody mentioned that there was this man... Yosef was in, was in a prison, in a dungeon, and they schlepped him out of the dungeon, they cleaned him up, and they brought him to Pharaoh because he had interpreted the dreams of fellow prisoners. He had interpreted them successfully. And so Pharaoh asks him to interpret his dream. And he tells him his dream, and Joseph, Yosef says to him, what God is about to do, he lets Pharaoh know. And then he interpreted the dream as being seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine, and that the famine will be so bad that the years of plenty will disappear and be swallowed up and not even be noticed. And the reason that the dream is repeated, because it's the same message in both dreams, the reason that the dream is repeated is because God hastens to do this, which means that it begins now. The repetition implies urgency. And therefore, this is what Pharaoh should do. He should store up all the food during the seven years of plenty, so that during the seven years of famine, he'll have what to eat. And Pharaoh was very impressed, and he appointed Joseph viceroy of Egypt. That's what people did in those days when they were impressed. If they liked you, you became the viceroy. What is the, the significant teaching or the significant message that we can get from the story? Number one, that Pharaoh was impressed with Joseph's interpretation, more so than with everybody else's interpretation, not because it was brilliant of him to figure out that there would be seven good years and seven bad years. That seems to be rather obvious from the dreams. I mean, seven healthy cows, seven unhealthy cows, seven healthy stalks, seven... So, the way the, the way the commentaries interpret it, the stalks obviously mean food. I mean, wheat is wheat. And the cows are the animals with which you plow the fields to make the wheat grow. So that 
it all goes back to food. So when you have healthy cows, it means good food, a lot of food. Unhealthy cows, lack of food. So that couldn't have been the brilliant insight that so impressed Pharaoh. What did impress him was, number one, his statement that what God is about to do, he tells Pharaoh. And number two, that therefore Pharaoh should store up food. Everybody else, the other interpreters of dreams, either predicted the future or described Pharaoh's condition or caught a glimpse of Pharaoh's subconscious. And all of them were probably correct. And yet Pharaoh was not content with those interpretations because somehow he sensed that there was more to the dream than merely an observation. There are times when a dream is clairvoyant in the sense that it anticipates a coming event. You have a dream, you wake up in the morning, and sure enough, that day, what you saw in your dream happened. That's a premonition. Well, we'll talk about why that happens in a moment. But it is not a lesson, it is not a message. You dream that you're going to see three green cars on the highway, and sure enough, you see three green cars on the highway. No? So? It's interesting. It's curious. The phenomenon is a very interesting phenomenon. But So Pharaoh didn't like those kinds of interpretations because this dream felt like something more. Somebody told him that he would have seven daughters and they would die. He would bury his... He says, now so what should I do? Somehow there was something missing in the interpretation because the dream was more urgent than that. Why is a dream urgent is what Pharaoh wanted to know. And it was only when Yosef came along and said, God is trying to teach you how to prevent a disaster. He says, now you're talking. Now I hear a message. Now I'm... Now I'm being taught something. Now I'm learning something. And so he made him the vice, vice for him. So the message that a dream carries, if it is in fact a message dream, is something you need to do. Your grandmother or grandfather appear in your dream, and they say, get out of the house now. Believe them and get out of the house. When there's an urgency to do, that kind of a dream is called a message dream. As soon as we need interpretation, as soon as we need to, to read symbolism into it, it is not a message dream. That's why when Yosef had his dreams, he dreamt that he and his brothers were out in the fields gathering, uh, uh, making bundles out of the, out of the wheat. What is that called? Sheaves. Sh making sheaves? Sheaving? <laughs> they were sheaving in the fields, and each one of them had their sheaves standing, and the sheaves belonging to the brothers all bowed down to the sheave belonging to Yosef. So Yosef comes to his brothers, and he tells them the dream. And they got angry at him. They said, what do you think? We're all going to bow to you? Yosef has a second dream where he sees the stars and the sun and the moon, and they're all bowing to him. So what does this Chacham do? He runs and tells his brothers that he had such a dream. So now they're even angrier at him. And they say, you mean your father and mother, in addition to us, are also going to bow to you? And they hated him whatever that means. And his father, the Torah says, and his father waited to see. Not a very responsible thing to do. The brothers hate each other, they're fighting, and the father's waiting to see. There's more meaning to it than that. Why did Yosef come with these dreams to his brother? If he felt that the dream meant that they would bow to him, so be patient and wait. What do you have to tell him for? I mean, he wasn't a child. 
And after the first time, when he saw that they got angry, certainly a second time, he should have known better. And what does it mean that the father, Yaakov, who was the choice, the greatest of the patriarchs, what does it mean he waited to see? Didn't he have anything more, a little more commi committal to do? I mean, something a little more specific? <coughs> the reason Yosef came to his brothers with the dream is because the dream didn't tell him anything. It's not that he interpreted the dream to mean that his brothers will bow to him. So what? Why is he being told this in a dream? Of what value is that information? So he wasn't content. He didn't have an interpretation of the dream. He came to his brothers so that they would interpret it for him. And to his shock, they interpreted it to mean that they will bow to him. Never occurred to Yosef that that's what the dream meant. And even after they interpreted it that way, he didn't buy it. What's the message? So what should I do? There was no message. So he dismissed it as an insignificant dream. The second time that he had a dream, again he came to them. For them to interpret. Hoping that there would be some message in it. And they again said, it means that even your mother and father will bow to you. So what kind of dream is this? Who needs this? In fact, there are fasts that are proclaimed when a person has these kinds of dreams and he doesn't want to have them because they're a nuisance. They don't tell you anything and yet they disrupt your life. So Yosef came to his brothers for an interpretation because the dream did not directly tell him to do anything and that kind of a dream he wasn't happy with. So dreams, when they have a specific instruction, might be a message, either from a grandparent or from a parent who has already passed away, or from some other saint or tzaddik. But if there is no specific message, then the best thing to do is simply disregard the dream. We know from experience, from recorded experiences, that if the dream is a message, you will have it a second time, like with Pharaoh. If the dream means to get you to do something, it will get you to do that thing, even if it has to happen three or four or five times. So if you have a dream and you think it's telling you to do something, do what Pharaoh did. Go back to sleep. If the dream is meant to get you to do something, it will. It will. You don't have to worry about it. In fact, in some uh, holistic medicine with this writings, we find cures, remedies for dreams that are clairvoyant. Which would mean that certain dreams that are predicting the future, that anticipate the future, which are annoying, can be cured with medicine. If it can be cured with medicine, it is not a prophetic dream. Prophecies do not respond to medication. <laughs> In fact, just as there is a mental state where people, while awake, imagine certain connections and certain similarities and symbols in what they see, and they interpret that to be some kind of a message from above, and there are voices speaking to them, and there are symbols being shown to them, and it's simply an irritation of the mind. If that can happen when we're awake, it can certainly happen while we're asleep. So dreams that seem to have all sorts of associations and combinations may simply be a restless sleep because the mind doesn't, doesn't rest, doesn't sleep. You look at the ancient writings, and I've got pages and pages of symbolisms in dreams. Now, some of these are very similar to Freudian interpretation, although they were written eight or nine hundred years before Freud. 
the head, the kidneys in a dream represent the dreamer, the person himself. The shoulders represent the wife and the sisters. The extremities represent children, sons and daughters. The arms, specifically, represent friends, family, servants. The hand itself represents wisdom. So that if you dream about your kidneys, There's a whole thing on metals. See, you have a dream, for example, and you dream that you're going over a cliff in a car. Now, here's where dream interpretation becomes complicated. When you dream that you're about to die, it says in the ancient writings that that's a very good sign. Huh? It's a good sign. It's a sign of long life. In fact, we're also told that if a rumor somehow gets started that a certain person died, then you know that that person will live long. So on the one hand, there's, there's the connotation of long life because you're seeing yourself die. And in a dream, it's reversed. If you see yourself die, that means that it's taken care of in the dream, and in real life, you'll live. Same thing with uh, if you see yourself being pursued by an animal, it's a good sign. If you see yourself sick, it's a good sign. Because it's taken care of in the dream and then you don't have to experience it in real life. In fact, the commentaries say that good people always have bad dreams. Bad people always have good dreams. <laughs> and that's why there's a custom that if someone tells you their dream, you're supposed to say to them, a good dream you saw. <coughs> and that's for two reasons. First of all, as with Yosef, a dream that doesn't have a specific message means what you interpret it to mean. And so if you interpret it as a good dream, it'll be a good dream. If you interpret it as a bad dream, it'll be a bad dream. That's one reason. The other reason is, it doesn't mean you saw a good dream. It means you saw the dream of a good person. And the dream of a good person is always bad. So if it was a bad dream, somebody comes to you had a terrible dream last night, you say, well, that's the dream of a good person. Because good people have bad dreams. And the reason for that is because in the dream, things are reversed. What happens in the dream need not happen in real life. In fact, psychology tells us the same thing. That when you sleep, you can experience in your dream those things that you're afraid to experience while you're awake. And so you get it out of your system, you take care of it in the dream, and then you don't have to worry about it in real life while awake. And the same thing with a bad dream. The good person who has a bad dream and he worries about it, that worry already makes up for whatever else had to happen. For the worry itself, he's already forgiven and his slate is cleaned and that's it. A bad person wakes up, he had a good dream, he feels good about himself, he's in trouble. So there's the inversion of the dream. But, like I started saying, you see a car going over a cliff. So on the one hand, you see yourself about to die. You never actually see yourself die, but about to die, and that's a good sign. But then you have to take into consideration the metal. The car is made out of metal. And then there's a whole list of what kind of metals and what they mean in your dream. Then, if the car falls into water, well, that's a whole other subject now, because water is very symbolic in dreams, and there's a whole chapter on water. If you fall into the water, you come out of the water, you go down, uh, you go down and don't come up, you go down and come up, you see yourself drowning, you're afraid of drowning, the water is cold, all of these things have a meaning. So, if somebody comes along and says, I dreamt that I fell over a cliff in my car into cold water, it's a very complicated interpretation. You got to figure out what the metal means, you got to figure out what the water means, you got to figure out what the death means, and so on. <laughs> what is it about dreams in the first place that makes them so fant fantastic and so fascinating? The soul that keeps us alive 
and with which we behave during the day is made up of five parts. There are five levels to the soul. There's one part of the soul with which we are in contact all the time. That's called nephesh. Without that, we simply are not alive. <coughs> nephesh. There's another part of the soul with which we function. A person who can't function but is still alive, his nephesh is active within him, but the other parts of his soul are blocked. They can't get through because the body is not receptive, because the limbs are damaged, the nerves, whatever, God forbid these things happen. And then higher and higher, the different parts of the soul produce different uh, abilities within the person. The higher the soul, the less restricted it is to time and space. So that our nephesh, the nephesh part of our soul, is very limited and it experiences and is conscious only of its own uh, five senses. That's what gives me an identity. If I experience what you were experiencing in your senses, I would be very confused as to who I am. So because I experience only my senses, I see only what I see and I feel only what I feel and I hear only what I hear, that's why I am me and not you. But the higher we go in these five levels of the soul, the more open-ended they are. So that, for example, a person who is truly a tzaddik, a truly godly person, meaning that the other parts of his soul are active within him on a daily level, on a constant basis, that person does not, in the first place, have the restrictions that most of us have. And therefore, they will have premonitions, and they will have uh, intuition, and they will have clairvoyant uh, visions, and they will simply know what tomorrow is all about. And this, to them, is not surprising, unusual, or uncomfortable. That's the level on which they exist, because their soul is active within them without being restricted within them. So it's almost like the soul is kind of a um, periscope. It can see what our eyes can't see. And not only ahead in space, but also ahead in time because they come together. If all five levels of the soul are available to the person, then he is a prophet, a true prophet. God speaks through him. If there are only four levels of the soul, then he will see visions of prophecy. God sends messages through him. If he has only three parts of the soul, then he may be clairvoyant, he may get glimpses of the future or of the past, but there is no message to the world coming through him, maybe not even to himself. If he has only two parts of the soul, he may see something in his dream. Because when the person goes to sleep, he releases his soul from the restrictions of the conscious function. So that when you're sleeping, many things can happen that your conscious mind would not permit when you're awake. And this can be good or it can be bad. For example, the bad stuff. In a dream, you can believe ridiculous things. You know, in your dream, you know that there is no one under your bed. You know it. And you tell yourself, silly. No, no. And yet you are frightened because there is something under your bed. And in your dream, you're talking to yourself and you're saying, no, nah, don't be silly. There's nothing under the bed. And yet your heart is pounding and you're having a nightmare. How can it be? that you know there's nothing under the bed and yet you're frightened by that nothing. That's a dream. In a dream, the rules of logic don't apply. You can also imagine things that you know are impossible, like an elephant going through the eye of a needle. You would never imagine it while you're awake. If you thought you saw an elephant going through the eye of a needle, you'd worry about your mental state. But in a dream, it's normal. 
Something is there and yet it's not there. It's big, but it's small. It's bigger than the other thing, but it's enveloped in the smaller thing, and these kinds of contradictions. Because the soul is released from the restrictions of the conscious mind. By the same token, it can also perceive things that are true and good, which the conscious mind blocks out. And so it is normal for the soul, when you're asleep, to see either past or future, or come up with insights into a subject you've been studying, which you could not come up with while you're awake. And that's why people who study a subject diligently will go to sleep not understanding the subject, and they will wake up and they have the answer. The answer came to them while they were asleep. It's not only that the mind is refreshed and you can approach the subject with a clear mind. You wake up knowing an answer. You know it. Because it came to you in your sleep. The person who studies Torah diligently is rewarded, so to speak, with lessons. While he's sleeping, he is being taught Torah. Someone once said he needed something. He was, in, and he needed he needed advice from a from a tzaddik, and the tzaddik was sleeping. And they said, "Well, we'll go wake him. It's it's urgent." He said, "Never mind. It's not as important as what he's probably learning right now in his sleep." What about nightmares? And here we get closer to our time. To some degree, our dreams reflect the thoughts that we dwell on during the day. Not that you will think about animals in your sleep if you thought about them while you're awake. It's not always that closely related. But the nature of your dreams reflect the nature of your thoughts. So that if you think pessimistically, your dreams will be negative. Not on the same subject necessarily, but in some way they will be negative because your thoughts are pessimistic. If you're very optimistic, your dreams will be optimistic. So we're taught that when we want to evaluate our moral condition. And every lesson, every speech, every time we get together, there has to be a moral lesson. Not just a curiosity subject and academic acrobatics. There has to be a lesson. What are we, what are we going to gain from this conversation? So we're told that in trying to evaluate our moral status, and moral status means godly status, are we godlike or have we lost our godly image? How do we know? Obviously, you can look at your behavior. But sometimes that can be tricky. A person can behave well and yet inside be corrupt, selfish. One of the things we look at in order to determine our moral condition is the nature of our dreams. Not the message of the dream, the nature of it. Are they meaningful dreams? Not prophetic, just meaningful. Are they intelligent? Do your dreams contain intelligent subjects? Are they pleasant? Are they friendly? Are they inspiring? Or are they the opposite? And what the Zohar tells us, the Kabbalah, when the person goes to sleep, the soul rises and returns to its natural habitat, and there it is refreshed, ready to come back for another day of struggling with the body. What does it mean that the soul rises? If you're engaged in a struggle with your children, let's say. Oh, that was last week's topic. 
If you're engaged in a struggle with the children, it wears you out. It's tiring. It's exhausting. How do you refresh yourself? Very simply, you turn inward. You don't have to go anywhere physically. You have to go back into yourself. Go back into yourself, again, doesn't mean anything mystical. It means simply pay attention to yourself. The books say, the articles say, do something nice for yourself. Take a nice, luxurious bath. That might help. But do something nice for yourself could also be a little bit more meaningful. Improve your own morality. You've been trying to get your kid to be a mensch, and that's exhausting. Get yourself to be a mensch. That's easy. It's refreshing. That's what the soul does when we go to sleep. During the waking hours, the soul wrestles with the body. When it goes to sleep, it does its own searching. It does its own soulful thing, and that refreshes it. It doesn't go on vacation. It doesn't retire for the night. It does what a soul naturally does, and that is more refreshing than doing nothing. That's why we find that when a Jew gets back into Jewish activities, more another mitzvah, he feels refreshed, not exhausted, because he's back in his element. And that is more refreshing than a vacation. It's more relaxing than doing nothing. So the soul doesn't go to sleep. The body has to rest, but the soul goes back to doing what souls would ordinarily do were it not stuck in a body. Now, if during the day we were living a more godly life, then when we go to sleep, the soul quickly and easily detaches from its efforts with the body and reverts back to itself. Then it has pleasant experience, and that is reflected in the pleasantness of the dream. It has a meaningful experience, and that is reflected in the meaningfulness of the dream. But if during the day, the, the, the hassle that the soul had with the body was so involved, it was so complicated, that it drags the soul down to where even when the body is asleep, it's hard to untangle itself from the body. So what happens is that the soul withdraws, retreats to some place between body and soul, and it gets stuck in the middle. And when that happens, you have nightmares. You have meaningless dreams. You have negative dreams, because the soul is aggravated. It's stuck. It's neither here nor there. In the same way, say, if you have a problem at the office, and finally the day is over, and you take a deep breath, you close the, the uh, attache case, and you turn the lights off in the office, and you feel better already. Because now you're free. You're yourself again. But that's only if you had a normal day at the office. If you had a messy day at the office, then even when the attaché case is closed and the lights are off and you're on your way home, nothing goes right. Then the traffic is bad, the weather is bad, the radio goes on the blink, you know. Nothing goes right because you're taking home with you this negative feeling that doesn't allow you to leave your work at the office and come home and be yourself. So you're stuck in between. You're not really at work, so you don't feel productive, and you come home and you cause misery in the family because, because you're in a rotten mood. You can't be home either, so you're neither here nor there, and it is, in fact, a nightmare. Only then it's a nightmare not only for you, for the family, for the children, for the neighbors, for the building. So the moral of the story is this. The nature of our dreams today generally are not prophetic, I think it's safe to say, 
They're not even messages. If they were, you would know it and you would do something. What they are, most likely, and in most cases, are a reflection of our moral status. If the dreams are pleasant and positive, then we're doing something right during the day. If our dreams are negative, empty, meaningless, and annoying, disturbing, they're not premonitions of terrible things going to happen. They're simply a reflection of a discomfort, an irritation in our waking life. Therefore, the practical thing to do after a negative dream is to simply improve the quality of our life. If we do that, then the dream has served a purpose, and that itself already feels better. It served a purpose. One of the reasons that bad dreams happen to good people is because when good people have a bad dream, they become better. When bad people have a bad dream, they become worse. So God doesn't give them bad dreams. He doesn't want to make them worse. This is the meaning of the dream. One more thought. Exile is called a dream. When Mashiach comes, the Torah says, it will be like waking up from a dream. We will realize that we had been dreaming. Hayinu kachelmen. We will suddenly wake up and realize that what had happened before was a dream. Again, how is exile a dream? Because in exile, particularly when it's lasted 2,000 years, strange combinations, contradictory things can coexist side by side, and we don't even raise an eyebrow. A person can study Torah all his life, or he can be a preacher all his life, and he can talk in the name of God, and think in the name of God, and study the Word of God, and so on and so forth, and at the very same time be doing something God doesn't want him to do. The example of the guy is about to break into a house. He wants to rob the house. But he knows that success comes from God. So he prays for success. And he doesn't see a contradiction. He asks God to give him success in his burglary. One moment we're feeling moral and positive and good and we're ready to do the mitzvah and we do the mitzvah and the next minute it's as if we never did it. And the same of course in reverse. We can be evil, truly genuinely evil one day and the next day as if nothing ever happened turn around and be good and be really good. A Couple of years ago that would have been called hypocrisy. Today if we call it hypocrisy it doesn't mean anything because if that's hypocrisy then we're all hypocrites. So the word has lost its meaning. It's more than hypocrisy. It's a dream. A dream in which contradictory things can coexist and not feel uncomfortable, not feel wrong. And that gives us a great opportunity. It's possible for a good person to go bad with, with no great reason, without any traumatic event, simply because it's a dream. But then again, it also gives a bad person the ability to become good without great trauma. You don't have to be the great Baal Tshuva and fast six days a week and cry every morning for forgiveness. You can become good simply by deciding to. How is it possible after not keeping certain mitzvahs for so many years? How can you just turn around and start keeping the mitzvah? After not being a moral person for so many years, how can you simply turn around and become moral? Won't it feel hypocritical? It doesn't matter. We're dreaming. And we have to take advantage of the dream. It permits us to become good for no reason at all. And with no preparation at all. We need no excuses. I was bad yesterday, so what? Today's different. 
That's hypocrisy? No, it isn't. I'm dreaming. And that's what's going to happen when Mashiach comes. If we look around and we say, look, look at how many people still need to change their opinions and to change their lifestyle in order to be ready for Mashiach. So how can we really believe that Mashiach is coming today? Isn't it going to take time to convince all these people? And the answer is not in a dream. In a dream, nothing takes time. In a dream, you don't have to follow a logical sequence. The bad can be over and the good begins in a second. And so Mashiach can come in a second. And that's the reality of our condition. When Mashiach comes, we wake up and we realize we've been dreaming. So the state of the dream invites us to simply make new resolutions, take on radically better habits and lifestyle and so on, begin to observe a new mitzvah, and you don't need excuses. You don't need to read up on the subject. You don't need to become a master of philosophy or the theology. You can simply allow yourself to be as good as anyone has ever been. It doesn't matter what you were until this very moment. The same is true with a birthday, and today happens to be my birthday. So the Rebbe wants us to celebrate our birthdays publicly, which is a new custom. Usually, birthdays were celebrated through intro introspection and a little bit of uh, isolation and contemplation, reflection on the past year and the coming year and so on. But recently, the Rebbe has said, that we have to celebrate our birthdays publicly, we have to make a big tumult about it, a lot of noise about it, and share our, uh, our resolutions, because on the day of the birthday, it says in Kabbalah, that a greater amount of your soul is accessible to you on that day than on other days. And therefore, what you want to accomplish and what you resolve to do will be more effective and more successful on the day of your birthday than any other day. So when we have a combination of a dream and a birthday, then we can do anything. We can really become radically better. And without, without any strain, without any effort, simply by deciding to take advantage of this free-for-all that is presented to us in this world before Mashiach comes. If you want to be good, you can. The instructions are there. The opportunity is there. The, the preparations are un unnecessary. And in a moment, we can turn ourselves, our community, and our world into a godly place. We can turn it into a wonderful place, even though a moment ago it seemed to be dark and doomed and hopeless. So I invite you to share in the spirit of the birthday and to take advantage of the dreams to, uh, to make radical steps, to simply turn around and surprise everyone who knows you by becoming better. It'll feel funny. People will be unbelieving, particularly yourself. You say, no, it's not me, it's not me. Who was this actor a while ago who grew a beard, wore the beard for a while, and then took it off? And he said he couldn't stand it. It made him it made him feel too dignified. <coughs> couldn't tolerate. Couldn't see himself being dignified. So our self-image limits us sometimes, and we can't believe ourselves being so good. But in a dream, you can believe it. You can believe it. And it's true. It's genuine. It's for real. The goodness is for real. And so, following the advice of how to celebrate a birthday, Contemplate and dwell on yourself. What does that mean? 
simple. Think about what you could be. Then think about what you ought to be. And then think about what you are. If that doesn't make you become better, it will. It's very simple. And in our days of Gullus, everything is simple. We can easily become bad, and we can just as easily become good. Now is it very hot? Yeah. Like extremely hot. If we open those windows, you'll be cold. Okay, I have no solutions. Can we open the door? Anybody want to tell us about their dreams? Some interesting dreams? What about Holocaust dreams? I mean, I've had many dreams of being chased by Germany, and I hear that to be a common thing amongst uh, Jewish friends, that they've had dreams. Particularly, I heard it from three people this week with Crystal Mike. There's a lot of controversy about that, a lot of talk about that. Uh, people who, are never, who have never been to a concentration camp will have dreams with such precise details, accurate details, of a given concentration camp. Um, my guess, this is not written anywhere, my guess is that, again, we're dealing with either positive dreams or negative dreams. For obvious reasons, negative dreams in our generation is dreams of holocausts. Because that's the negativity of our generation, the evil of our generation. And possibly in the Middle Ages, when people had dreams that were negative, it was about dragons. Or vampires. Because for some reason, evil expressed itself in those forms in those days. Evil expresses itself in Holocaust today. Which doesn't mean that the person who has that dream had any relationship to the Holocaust in reality. It, it means, rather, that the Holocaust was not a one-time event. The Holocaust is the personification of the evil of our generation. So that if you have an evil dream, it will be about a Holocaust. Even if you never heard of the Holocaust. I guess, in a sense, the Holocaust goes on. The evil goes on. Only now it's safely tucked away in dreams, where it belongs. And again, bad dreams happen to good people. <clears throat> yes? I have a question about bad dreams happen to good people, good dreams happen to bad people, and then you said if you're a positive person, you have a positive dream. Negative, if you're a negative person, you have a negative dream. I think there's a contradiction there. If your dreams are consistently negative, okay. it's telling you something about yourself. If your dreams are consistently positive, and yet you have a bad dream, that's a bad dream happening to a good person. In other words, the bad dream should be an, an exception. It should be an event, not a nightly I might be experienced. Yeah? Well, assuming we all have dreams, what about people who very rarely dream? We all dream. The question is whether we remember them. Whether we're conscious of them when we wake up. Um, I, again, just guessing now, I would say that unless the dream has a very important message or is very positive and inspiring, you're better off not remembering it. So don't worry about it. Yeah? I had a dream that my former husband uh, started drinking again and using drugs. And he's a, an alcoholic. He's gotten trouble from it. He's passed several times due to his attitude, which um, the drinking brings it out and he gets in trouble. And then I had a dream that he got out of prison. He went to prison this time. And after he got out of prison, it was about four months he had to spend in there. And I was waiting for him afterwards. And we got back together. You mean that when you dreamt that he was getting back into trouble, he actually did? It was due to his drinking again. Right. So right now, he's recovering again. Right. Did, did you dream about his coming out of prison also before it happened? Um, 
No, I dreamt that he learned his lesson through going to prison. He came to know um, God more in a personal relationship. And then we got back together afterwards. Okay. Again, when a person's sleeping, the soul is not as restricted as it is when you're awake. And therefore, time and space do not interfere. So that in a dream, you can dream about something happening to your mother, although she's on the other side of the world, and it's probably happening. Or you can have a dream about a close friend, and it's probably happening, or a child, or a husband, a wife. Again, the nature of the dream is, is important. If you dream only that he's in trouble again, that would tell you the nature of your relationship. You are very closely bounded to each other. But what bonds you is negativity. That's how you relate when you're together, and that's what you uh, clairvoyantly sense when you're apart. If you also uh, have premonitions in your dream about his becoming healthier again, then that's a, an indication that your relationship is a healthy relationship and that what bonds you is good news, not only bad news. And when you have both, it means that you have a thorough bond. You're connected on both levels so that if something bad happens, you'll feel it. If something good happens, you'll feel it. I also had another dream recently that, uh, and I, I am, my sister and I are not talking, but that her husband got up from the dinner table and had a heart attack suddenly and she was not prepared for it and he died. And I was very disturbed about it. And, uh, so I called her and notified her to ask her just to let her know to be prepared. And she said, I don't know. I can never be prepared for such things, but we have to talk about it. And it hasn't happened? Not yet. Probably not. Probably not. It's a good dream. <laughs> Why would a good person relive an unpleasant real life experience? In dreams? In dreams, over and over again. Well, because something that that experience was supposed to accomplish is not finished. And again, referring to any dream, by the way, if you have a dream that makes you uncomfortable, or if you're having many dreams and you'd rather not, one of the, one of the things to do is to give charity in the amount of a meal whatever it would cost you to eat a meal. Give that amount of charity with the intention, asking God to please take away the dreams. Whether they're recurring dreams or a one-time dream, but uh, charity is the antidote to bad premonitions and stuff like that. So maybe the dream is simply meant to get you to do another mitzvah. And if you give it tzedakah, that'll be the mitzvah and you'll be finished with it. Try it. Uh, no money back guarantee. <laughs> uh, does God have dreams? He has nightmares. <laughs> I don't know if God has dreams. Um, I think when we have dreams, we're a little bit closer to God, a little closer to truth. Um, does that mean that God has dreams? I suppose if we can dream, he can certainly dream. Anything we can do, he can do better. <laughs> but I don't, I don't know. Nightmares he has. Nightmares. A lot of nightmares. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sleeplessness, yeah. We keep him, we keep him awake. <laughs> it's 11 o'clock, we're not home, he worries. <laughs> I mean that, I mean that literally. The eleventh hour, you know, it's like time and... It's hard for him to wait as it is for us. Yeah? I want to know, if, like, I have a lot of times dream that I can see something is happening and then like in five, six or a week, month later that thing will happen. And I'm not... Uh, I'm not sure I'm a good person at that level. So I can see it, so, you know, I have the, the, the whole level of it, so. Now, what I'm saying is that a tzaddik will see it when he's awake. What you see in a dream that might come true five weeks later, the tzaddik sees while he's awake. So what's... Because his neshama is not restricted the way ours is. Because our neshama is restricted, the only time we get a glimpse of anything besides the immediate present 
is when we're sleeping in dreams. But again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't attribute too much significance to something happening that you dreamt about five weeks ago because almost anything you dream about will happen within five or six weeks. Unless it's, unless it's weird. But any normal event is a normal event. Sooner or later it's going to happen. So it, it's, it's more the kind of a dream that you want to go to somebody and say, is there any meaning to this? Because it doesn't seem to happen. Well, it was once it was like I had a dream that, um, that my father was in an accident. That so, I, I woke up, I called in the morning.